friends, I'm Lisa, also known as Fiber Nymph. This is not a 90% knitting video. This is a special episode, so if you're here looking for some fiber content, this is not it, though I will probably have my next 90% knitting episode up within the next few days, probably over the weekend, so check back for that. However, I really would like it if you'd stick around, um, if you would like to hear about my special topic today, because it's sort of a niche topic. Um, I'm here to talk to you about some business things and how this happened is this is actually sort of a video response to some videos that I watched that my friend Paige, um, who you might know as Paige the Framer, she also has a YouTube channel and she's in our fiber community. Um, she is so much more than that though. She does a lot of things. She's a picture framer by profession and she has a shop called Frame and Fiber out in Point Pleasant, New Jersey. So. Um, that's a little bit about her, but she has been doing this thing called May Live a Day. So she's going live every day in the month of May, and she's been very organized and has had themes for every week. But one week she was doing the topic of business, and as a person in business, she was sharing her experience about a lot of things business oriented. And myself, being a person in business, I found those videos really um, fascinating, well, fascinating from the standpoint of, um, we have similar businesses, but also very different businesses. I mean, obviously I'm not a picture framer, but we also, also both have, um, you know, the fiber arts connection. And so it was really interesting to me listening to her talk about her experience over the past 20 years that she's been in business. And the whole time I'm watching her videos, I thought, oh, I have so much to say about so many things that she was talking about. And so I half jokingly said to her, I said, I feel like I need to do a video reply to what you're talking about. And she was like, yeah, go for it. So here I am. This is my video reply to the things that Paige talked about. I would highly encourage you to check out Paige's channel, um, not just for her live a day content. I haven't actually caught many of her lives because I'm never on online at the right time, but they're on there that you can watch them on replay. Um, but just her content in general, she's delightful. She does a lot of gardening also and chickens. She has chickens, so that's always fun. Anyway, I'm not here to talk to you about chickens, but I am here to talk to you about business stuff. And the reason I wanted to record this also as a not just to reply to Paige's videos, um, but over the past 11 years that I've been in business, I have had people approach me and ask me questions, um, you know, the how and the why and the what of having started my business. And most of the time when I get those kind of questions, I often get them with the sense that the person asking is almost feeling apologetic for asking or feeling like maybe they shouldn't be asking, maybe they're encroaching on territory that's none of their business. And I feel bad that that's the case because if you're someone who is even mildly contemplating starting a business, whether you want to do it next week or next year or five years from now, it's really good to start by gathering information and getting some idea of what you might be getting into by starting a business. Obviously, everybody's experience is going to be a little bit different, but there are common areas that I think almost every entrepreneur entrepreneur, I have a trouble with that word, um, has experienced in one way or another. So that's what I'm going to share. Um, I'm going to share my perspective on some of the things that Paige talked about in her videos. I've watched her videos three times and I've taken notes. <laughs> so I'm going to just go down through the things that I took notes about and share my perspective on those things. If you haven't seen Paige's videos, I will sum up what she was talking about. But again, I think her videos were also worth watching if you are someone who thinks you would like to maybe someday start a business or, or if you're just curious about the process. Um, likewise, if you are someone who already owns a small business and you've already gone through this, I would love it if you would reply to either my video or Paige's video or videos or all of them um, and share your experience because I think we can all learn from that. Um, it's really difficult to get this kind of information in one place. I mean, I know my own experience when I decided to start my business, I did a lot of searching online 
and you can find things here and here and here and there are some really good resources but I really like to find first-hand experience as opposed to official business how to like there's nothing wrong with that that's great information but I wouldn't I like that one on that individual um, kind of experience. I, I always feel like I get a little bit more out of that. So that's what I'm here to share with you today. I'm going to try to keep this from being an excessively long video. Um, but here we go. And I'm going to start by just sharing my story of my origin story <laughs> of my business, because some of you may already know it. If you've watched my regular podcast for very long, um, I have shared this story before, but I thought it would be a good jumping out off point for this particular video. So Fiber Nymph Dye Works is my business. I started that business 11 years ago this past January. So I've been in business about almost 11 and a half years now. And the whole reason I decided to start it, well I chose yarn dyeing because I was an avid knitter and I really liked self-striping yarn. It was hard to come by then other than commercial self-patterning, self-striping yarns. Those were out there. But as far as indie dyed self-striping yarn, there were not a lot of people doing that at that time. And so that was what I knew I wanted to do. Um, but why did I want to do it at the time that I decided to start it 11 years ago? Great question. Um, I had two kids who were in high school and I was a homeschooler, so they were home with me. This is what I had been doing all through their childhood. And as they were in high school, they were getting to be more and more independent in what they were working on. And I knew that within a couple of years, they were both gonna graduate and I was suddenly gonna be left with a whole lot of time that had previously been dedicated to homeschooling. So what I wanted to do was put something in motion and get it set up that I would be able to grow once they were out of school. Um, and also I wanted to have something going that maybe they could take part in while they were still at home and get some experience um, in various aspects of business. So that was my why, it was twofold. I started from home, I'm, I still work from home. I've never branched out to getting an actual studio thought about it a couple of times, um, but there was really no need because for what I do, I'm able to accommodate that where I live, both here and at my previous house where I lived. So that was why I started. Um, my business did grow way faster than I had anticipated, but that is not a hardship. I mean, it, it has its hardships, but it was a good thing. So um, I love what I do and I've really never regretted the choice to start when I did. Um, it actually was very fortuitous in a lot of ways. So that is my background of how Fiber Nymph Dye Works came to be um, in a nutshell. So now I'm going to start going through these points that I point, picked out from Paige's videos. And the first video she did, she talked about a business plan. Um, she didn't really share her exact business plan or even give you the how-to of doing a business plan. That is one of those things that you can find a lot of places online. Um, the reason you might want to do a business plan, number one, if you're starting a business that you're going to need to acquire um, a loan, a business loan to start, you'll definitely need to have a business plan. That was not the case for me. I did not take out a loan. In fact, I started my business on a very low, low budget. I literally um, saved $500 <laughs> from our household budget and I used that $500 to buy my initial um, investment of materials. I built a lot of my own equipment at the time. In fact, some of it I still use to this day because it works for me and it was not super expensive. Um, but yeah, that's what I started. I started with $500 worth of materials and ever since I started, every time I do a shop update, I always take a large percentage of my income from those updates and I invest it right back into my business. That is always how I have operated and it's worked for me. Um, the scale of my business allows that to be beneficial. So I did not have that loan requirement need for a business plan. And to be quite honest with you, I've never actually written out an official business plan. But what I have done is over the years, I've had a good idea of what I want to do and why. Um, I just said to you, I knew I wanted 
to do self striping yarn that was my initial what um, why did I want to do it because I like that kind of yarn I couldn't find that kind of yarn and I found the process of learning to do it really um, I don't want to say fascinating because I keep using that word um, I enjoyed the challenge of learning how to dye self striping yarn and it's funny because 11 years later I'm still finding new ways to accomplish that kind of dyeing technique. Um, there are so many things that you just continue learning when you're in business and that's part of the fun of it for me. Um, anyway, it's always it was always a good idea, I thought, to have that kind of thing at least written down just for myself to reflect on because that is what I do often at least once a year. Um, a lot of times it is around January, the new year, just because that's a natural time to relook at your you know your aspirations and your intentions and things but it's also around the time that I started my business originally I will look back at what I'm doing I'll look at the past year see what worked see what maybe didn't and what worked one year a few years later may not really be the best thing anymore so from that perspective that is where I think a business plan or just sort of an outline or just something tangible that you can see written down really comes in handy. I find it helpful. Um, and I can look back over the years and see like, wow, there was a really big shift like here. Um, and like, for example, I would say, ordinarily I would say five years ago, but since we just went through two years that like, you know, were those mystery years that we've lost. I would say about seven years ago, there was a really big shift in the indie dyeing industry. Um, a huge influx of new indie dyers were starting to pop up and that really has not slowed down. I've never seen that as a bad thing. I know a lot of dyers are like, oh my gosh, there's so many people and you know, okay, so people are trying something and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, none of us do the exact same thing in the exact same way so it's not a problem some of those people are still doing it and they've you know been really successful others were kind of there for a little while and then they decided to stop for whatever reason and it doesn't matter but the point is at that point in my business it affected how I needed to move forward and so that was a time that I did have to reassess my own business ideas and my business plan on what I wanted out of my business and how I was going to get it. Another point I can point to would be when I decided to um, step up my vending game, so to speak, and that was probably about four years ago. It was before the pandemic. Um, I want to say 2018, 2019, right around there. I started doing some of the bigger shows like the Stitches events. Um, and I did that because I felt like I should. Shoulds are not always the best way to go about changing something in your business. I've learned that. Um, and what I did learn from that, while they were fine and I enjoyed doing them, they were a lot of work, which is fun. I don't have a problem with doing a lot of work, but I also found they were not the best match for my business and the way I do it. There are other vendors who absolutely rock those kind of huge shows um, and I think that's awesome they're not the best fit for me will I ever do one again maybe um, right now I'm not vending at all for a number of reasons but that will change because I, I do foresee that I will get back to doing at least a couple of shows here and there eventually um, but probably not a lot of the big shows because after I did them and I was able to look back at them I saw that like the outcome of them was not what I really wanted from them and it wasn't a good fit for my business and that was a valuable thing to learn so those are a couple of examples of why having your plan whether you call it a business plan or not written down just so you have it as like a touchstone to be able to go back to every once in a while and evaluate where you're at where you want to go um, are you still on the same path that you want to be on and to be honest with yourself um, and, you know, looking at it currently, my business has changed, as so many businesses have over these past couple of years. Sometimes the things that change our businesses are completely outside of our control because who could have, you know, 
thought, oh, there's going to be a worldwide pandemic coming. I need to change my business options ahead of time. No, we don't think like that. Um, but lo and behold, that's what so many of us had to do. And as a result, I can look back at these past couple of years and say, you know, even though there was this huge catastrophe happening around the world, like I was able to make things work this way, this way, and this way. And then these other things that usually worked really well for me didn't work so great over those years. And I was able to shift and adjust and it worked out okay. And I've, I've learned some really valuable lessons about myself and about my business over these past couple years that I would not have learned any other way. So I, I try always to look for the positives anyway, um, but I think that's a beneficial thing to do. You know, even in a bad situation, what good came out of it? What can you find that was positive? And again, looking at my business plan, I can see things that would have never transpired probably, or at least not in the same way, if these past two years hadn't have happened. And I'm now looking at ways that I can take thing, those things and kind of move them forward and incorporate, you know, not the, the direness of the situation, but incorporate what I've learned into some things that I wanna try in the future. So it's ever changing. A business plan is not a static, one time carved in stone thing. It's always going to be something that is going to be changing with the times, with your times, with your life. I mean, my husband's going to retire from his job next year and that's going to be a huge shifting point. He was going to retire this year um, and then he pushed it off till next year. So that's why I'm sort of in this hiatus time with doing shows because I'm not going to go into all those details right now, but um, I just, I want to wait until he's retired to see where I'm going to go with shows. And I just know that that's going to be an adjustment um, in my business as well as in our life. So it's all good, though, you know. OK, let's move on. The next topic that Paige had addressed in her videos was struggles and fears. And um, one of the things she said that she struggles with is knowing how to communicate what she does to the customers that she wants to bring in. And I can really relate to that. Um, I am not awesome at social media. I don't enjoy social media just in general in life. <laughs> and so having to do that for your business is sort of a challenge when you don't like to be on social media that much to begin with. Um, I sort of have a love-hate relationship with it, I guess. Um, and it changes so much too. Everything's always changing. And then there's the algorithm that you always hear about. The algorithm has changed and what have you. Um, it's hard to stay on top of that kind of thing and be able to do everything else that I do as a single person in business, not a single person, as a person who is in business by herself <laughs> um, and who I wear many, many hats, as do a lot of entrepreneurs who are in business by themselves. Um, having to do everything is hard. And there are some things that I just choose to not focus a lot of attention on because I don't have the time. I can spend that same amount of time dyeing yarn or rescaining or um, sending out newsletters, things like that I can do. Um, but I'm probably never going to be one of those business people who's posting something to my business Instagram account every single day or multiple times a day. I don't have that in me and I don't like to feel like I am constantly selling. Um, I struggle with that with my podcast, 90% Knitting. I've done my podcast for even longer than I had my business. It predated the business by um, about three, four months. Um, but my podcast has always been just sort of a natural way for me to share about my business. It's not all I talk about, but there are times where I feel like, oh my gosh, am I talking about my business too much? <laughs> am I, am I talking about, you know, am I doing projects with too many of my own yarns? And that's silly because of course I'm going to use my own yarns for projects. I use other people's yarns too. I use commercial yarn, but, um, yeah, that's one of the ways I choose to communicate about my business. Um, I'm always looking for new ways, but it is not my strong suit. 
Um, I will say that this is one of those things I wish I could farm out to someone else, but it's not something that I could easily farm out to someone else because nobody else knows my business like I do because I'm the one who's here all day, every day. So that's something to consider. Like, how are you going to get word out about what you do? Um, for many years, it seemed like Ravelry was a really great sort of built in way of sharing about fiber arts businesses. Um, that's become less and less the case over recent years, especially with a lot of the changes and problems that Ravelry has had in recent years um, and accessibility issues. But also I think it's just the fact that things have grown and there are so many more venues online for people to learn about. And so I've personally made the choice to try to branch out and share things in many other places other than Ravelry. Um, because I feel like that's a good choice. Um, it's sort of like a don't put all your eggs in one basket sort of thing. So communicating what you do, that is important and it is a struggle for me at times. Um, also, um, Paige had talked about, you know, she's experienced times where she loses customers if she goes outside of the box that people seem to want to put her in as far as what she shares like on her podcast or on her you know Instagram feed or what have you and I can kind of relate to that um, you know I've as I said my initial goal for my business has always been to do self striping yarn and over the years there have been times where I've gone away from that I mean I've always continued to do self striping but I've all I've often added a lot of other types of yarn um, variegated and speckled and you know there's trends and if you don't tune into those trends as a business person you can get left behind or you can fear being left behind so that is something that I have found to be a real a balancing thing you have to figure out how can I you know meet the needs of peop what people are looking at and wanting these days but not cease to be true to what my core goal is for my own business so that's something that I continue to work on. I do, you know, put out other things other than self-striping from time to time, but I continually bring myself back to this is what I do. Self-striping is my focus. It's my passion and I need to keep myself on that track to be true to my business. And I know like from shows especially like people will just walk right past my booth without even coming in when they see self-striping samples because Maybe they don't knit self-striping socks. Maybe they don't knit socks at all. Maybe that's not their jam. And that's fine. I have to be okay with that. I have to be okay with not fitting into everyone's mold for what a yarn dyer should be. It just has to be okay. Um, another big thing that Paige talked about, and this is a huge one for me, is being alone a lot of the time. Um, when you work for yourself, and especially when you work from home, like I do, Paige has a brick and mortar shop that she goes to, so I think maybe she probably has the opportunity to come face to face with people a little bit more frequently than I do. In a given week, the most opportunity I come to having face to face interactions with other people other than the people who live in my house with me is when I go to Walmart to grocery shop. <laughs> um, that's not optimal but yeah I mean I chose this business I chose to work from home and I would say 90% of the time it's amazing um, it fits my personality I am an introvert I I recharge by being alone um, but then there's that other 10% where it would be so nice to have somebody around to be able to bounce ideas off of or to just vent if I'm feeling down or frustrated or if something's not going right or if I just need some input. You know, I can talk to my husband. He's really good about that, but he's not a yarn dyer. He's not in, in that industry. It's not the same as talking to somebody else who works in the fiber arts. You know what I mean? And that is something that I miss. Um, and that's something that I have missed about not doing shows because that was one of those opportunities when I vended, I was around tons of other people who did this. And, you know, even if we didn't share like huge secrets, it was just great 
to have that interaction because you knew you were with people who had shared experiences. So that can be a struggle. So if you're somebody who is thinking about going into business and you're going to be working from home, maybe you have kids at home still, or you just, you don't enjoy being out around other people, just keep in mind that too much of a good thing isn't always a great thing. Um, and you might need to find other ways to connect. The internet, I will say, has been wonderful for that because especially with the advent of Zooms and being able to talk to people over the internet, um, you know, visually, not just texting or, or emailing, that has been a real perk um, of these past couple of years because I've been able to do that a whole lot more. So I would say that's one of those things that I'm carrying forward into the future, um, finding ways to connect that way more, which leaves you feeling just not quite as alone all the time. I would love to get together like a network of other self-employed people. They wouldn't even have to all be fiber artists, but just people who like me work from home, are alone most of the time. And um, we could just talk and, you know, have coffee and share our frustrations or our joys or our successes. It would be amazing. Okay. So anyway, um, Oh, another thing that Paige had mentioned was one of her struggles about being at work alone so much is motivation. Um, I don't have that problem so much. If anything, I probably have the opposite problem. Like I can be motivated to do a mazillion things way. And I put way more stuff on my plate than is even remotely possible for me to fulfill. And then I get into the point of, over scheduling myself or over planning and then I start working seven days a week and when you work from home that is a risk you run um, it's really easy to work all the time I would say there's probably not an even when I do make a conscious choice to like try to take Saturday and Sunday off like really work work like not dying not rescaining not you know being on the computer half the day um, there's always gonna be something that I'm going to do, like even if it's just responding to an email or checking in on something in the shop, you know, I'm work is always going to be there. Um, that I, I've not found a way around that, <laughs> but my husband will often call me on it whenever I get to the point where the weekend comes and I try to keep the weekend open at least one day of the weekend so that I can work with him and like do stuff around the house or we can go somewhere or whatever. But there are times where I'm like, I can't, I really need to work. I'm behind. He's like, you're always behind. You always need to work. And he's right because I take on too much. So that is something that I really try to be aware of. Um, and it's hard because I love working. That's weird to say because I don't think I was ever, I know I was never that way. Anytime I ever worked another job for another person, no matter how much I liked the job, I was never like, yes, I want to be there all the time. This, I love what I do and I love working and I have to make myself not do that. Um, on the flip side of that, Managing my time, actually I guess it's related, managing my time is something I do struggle with because um, if I have a deadline, like when I do pre-orders, you know, I always put in the listing, this will be shipping in two to three weeks, or this will be shipping in four to six weeks. So I have a built-in deadline, or if I do a wholesale order, I've told my wholesale customer, this order will ship by such and such a date. Those deadlines I can do really easily like that's great I can put that on there but let's say shop updates I don't have a hard and fast shop update schedule I never have I used to try to do them like well when I very first started I was doing a shop update every Friday <laughs> I can't even imagine doing that now um, I know there are some dyers who do and God bless you if you're one of them I'm not um, I try to do at least two decent updates a month and then I throw in some other things here and there, but because I don't have a set update schedule, it's really easy to like push them back or maybe not get them up as soon as I thought I would. Um, and then, you know, that has other problems associated with it. So I would say 
And I have tried to say, okay, I'm going to do an update the second and fourth Fridays or second and fourth Saturdays of every month. I have tried scheduling that out ahead of time. It does not work for me. I do not work that way. My brain does not work that way. And it's almost as if I will rebel against myself when I try to set those kind of false deadlines because that's what they are because there's nothing driving those except myself. And if I haven't announced them to anyone else, then, you know, nobody's going to hold me to it. Should I announce them to people? No, I shouldn't. Because then I become miserable. And then, you know, I'm more likely to say, oh, I have to push the update back from Saturday to next Wednesday. And, you know, that's okay to happen every once in a while. But I don't like doing that because I feel like that just says, oh, you're not reliable. And that might be the case in that point. I was not reliable to get the update done whenever I said I was going to, but it's not so much reliability as it is my own internal structure of how I work. Um, and I don't think I can explain that any better. Um, I just know that for me, I work best when I have flexibility. That's one of the things I love about being my own boss. I have a lot of flexibility. I mean, flexibility only works so far because if you're too flexible to the point that you're just sort of flaky, <laughs> your customers are going to start to realize that and they're going to be like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, um, I hope I'm not to that point ever. Um, but I, I personally need to work within a flexible schedule for me to work at my best. So call me a crazy artist, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that's what works best for me. And see, that's one of the bonuses of working for yourself is you have that ability to structure your business in the way that best fits you. You don't have to be a carbon copy of how someone else does their business. You know, do what works for you. Make the changes that will work best for you because you're going to have to make changes. You know, what works now isn't going to work in a year or two, maybe. Might not even work next month. You never know. Things happen. Um, and I just love having that flexibility. You know, for instance, a few years ago, my mom had to have a hip replacement. And her I had been planning to go to Florida to be with her for that. And then suddenly her surgery got moved up by, I think, two months. And I was like, okay. And thankfully I did not have anything super hot on the, on my schedule. And I was able to, to punt and like say, okay, I can be there. And I went early. And if I was working a regular job or I had a more rigid schedule in place for myself, it may not have been as easy. And so I like having that ability, um, to be able to be there for other people in my life, um, at the same time as working and making an income. Okay. Um, fears. I would say my biggest fear, and I think this is probably shared by a lot of people, is that suddenly I'm going to have no customers and I'm not going to be able to make an income and I'm going to have to go get a real job. <laughs> it's the truth. Like I've been doing this long enough to know that my business is cyclical it does not even follow the same exact pattern every year. So I can't say, oh, I know that like January and February are always really slow. And then this month is really, really busy. It doesn't follow that kind of a pattern. I just know after doing this long enough that there are going to be lulls and then there will be really busy times and that has to be okay. Um, and I have to trust myself enough to know that I am good at what I do and if I keep doing what I do as well as I can and with the highest level of integrity that I will maintain a loyal customer base and hopefully word will get out and I will continue to get new customers. Um, it's really, it really is a leap of faith. I, I don't know how else to say that. Um, sometimes I fear that I'm going to run out of ideas for new colorways. That's, that's a fear. Um, and that's why I often will do my serendipity skeins because that just gives me a chance to play. I play in the studio and I do new colorways that I don't write down. I may not ever do them again, but it gives me a chance to just play with colors and patterns and 
that leads to new ideas. Um, I'm never lacking for inspiration. That is definitely not the problem. As if you follow my yarn at all, you know that I'm largely inspired by nature and I live in the mountains and I, I travel to different places occasionally and I'm always, always inspired by things. Um, but I, I still have that fear that I'm going to, oh my gosh, I'm not going to have a colorway idea. Like, what am I going to do? It's like, you know, when the holidays come around, like I've done Halloween colorways for 11 years. Like, do I have another one in me? I don't know. <laughs> and I always do. Some are more popular than others, but that's okay too. So I'm going to move on to the last segment and that was strengths and successes. And, um, it's helpful. Paige pointed out, it's helpful when you do have someone else who can like give you their perspective on what they think your strengths are. Um, we don't all have that, but that's okay too. Um, so it's helpful to discover what your own strengths are and be honest about it. You know, we all have strengths. We all have weaknesses. Like I know organization, like not with my business, like I'm pretty organized with my business stuff, but when it comes to doing like keeping track of my expenses. Like I have a box, <laughs> literally I've got a box. I throw my receipts in there all year long, all year. And I have folders on my phone for like when I have e receipts and everything like emailed receipts. And as much as my intention always is, I'm going to keep up with these every month and put them into my spreadsheet. So the tax time is easier. I haven't done that in years. Every year I get to probably about February and I think I have to sit down and do this now <laughs> it just is what it is I quit fighting it I always get it done and I'm always miserable for the few days that I'm working on it but it always gets done it's a weakness and I've already told you like doing social media stuff that is not my strong suit but I do have strengths I'm really good with color I love color. I think I'm innovative when it comes to working with striping patterns and innovating new striping patterns. Um, when I came up with inversibles, that was so much fun. I, I'm pretty sure I was the first dyer to do that kind of a thing, the mismatched pairs. There could have been somebody else out there that I didn't know about. And I know there are more people doing things like that now. And that's great. But that was just so much fun coming up with just what seemed like a really simple idea. And people have loved it. And it's one of those things that I've been able to dye all these years that people still enjoy. So that makes me feel really good. And that feels like a success too. It's a place where my strength led to something that was successful. Same way with my Pi Day colorways. Like that was just sort of this weird idea I had one time and it took off and I still love doing my Pi Day colorways. They've morphed over the years. They're less literal than they started out because they literally started out as flavors of pies. <laughs> um, obviously that has transformed into much uh, less literal things like this year was crystal pie. You know, I did dark crystal colors, light crystal colors, but the patterning is still the pie pattern. And I have people who every time I bring one out, they, they purchase it and because they really love them. And I think that's exciting. And then more and more people find out about them. Some people are like, I could never knit with those because I have to have my things match and that's okay. You know? Um, anyway, so I would say playing with color and playing with patterns has definitely been a strength for me and it really is what my business depends on. Um, I would say another strength I have is customer service and that's not me tooting my own horn, but I feel very, very strongly that I always want my customers to be happy. And if there's ever anything that has gone wrong or they're unhappy with, I will do whatever I can to make things right and to make customers happy. I try to be proactive in that. Um, if something has happened, you know, with an order and they may not have noticed it already, like I will reach out to them first, especially if it's something that has happened because there's a glitch on my website or whatever. Like I, I will never say, Oh, that's not my problem. Or, Oh, I don't know what, how that happened. I'll never blow somebody off. At least I hope nobody has ever felt like I've blown them off when they've you know, come to me with something like that. I always try to be very upfront and very transparent about things. Um, and I have made mistakes. I mean, there have been some doozies 
of things that have gone wrong. Um, I've shipped orders to the wrong people. Um, it's, you know, it's mortifying when you do it, but nobody's perfect. I am definitely not perfect. So, um, I would, but I would say my strength is in how I deal with those things because I would say 99% of the time, um, things have been resolved and my customer has been happy and I feel good about the way I did it because I did it with integrity and that is really important to me. Okay. So lastly, success. Um, I would say that, okay, well actually first I will say that Paige said, <laughs> you know, she mentioned how the definition of success for a lot of us changes over time. And that's definitely true for me. Um, you know, success for me when I was first starting out was, is anybody going to buy this yarn? <laughs> My daughter will tell you that every single update I did when I was first starting, I was always like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, nobody's going to buy this. And then updates would start and I'd be watching the orders come in. I'm like, oh my gosh, people are buying my yarn. Oh my God, why are they doing that? <laughs> and she's like, mom, that's what you want them to do. It's like, I know. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> really just nuts. But anyway, you know, at this point, it's not so much um, having an update sell out. My updates never sell out anymore. And that's okay because that's hard. For a long time, I stressed over that when I was doing the small updates and then they would sell out and then there would be nothing in my shop until my next update. Like I like having an inventory in my shop so that when people stumble upon my shop or if they can't make it, you know, the day of the update, there's still things there for them. That's good. That is like something I've worked towards. Um, I would say, you know, yes, financially, I, would I say that I'm a success financially? I guess that's what I'm thinking. If you define financial success as being able to meet your financial goals as like paying my bills, Yes, I've been able to do that. Um, at this point, I'm not completely reliant on it the way I was for a couple of years um, when it was just me. Um, it was after my husband and I separate, my ex-husband and I separated. I mean, my income was all I had. And that was that point where I'm like, wow, I am really glad I started this business when I did because I had it and I could, I was able to take it and go completely full time with it at that point. And that was a good thing. And so I felt very successful. That was satisfying, um, knowing that I could rely on myself and my business and this thing that I built was able to help me and support me. But the finances can't be all of it. Like if you're starting a business just because you want to make a lot of money, like I personally would never find that to be the most, um, the epitome of success for myself. There has to be something more to it for me, something more intrinsically rewarding. And I would say um, that for me, a lot of that comes with people. Um, you know, obviously, like I said, I don't, I'm not in physical contact with people very often, but I hear from my customers on a fairly regular basis, either a little note that they send along with an order or I'll get emails or things people post on social media that let me know that they're enjoying what I make um, and they're able to use that in their making and that brings them happiness and that is super fulfilling to me. And over the years, I've gotten some absolutely beautiful messages from people. And again, I'm not saying this as like, oh, I'm so wonderful. <laughs> It's not that kind of thing. It's just that I'm just doing what I do. Like, I love my job. I love what I do, dyeing yarn. I never in a million years would think that my yarn could have such a positive impact on somebody's life in some way that it did, whether it means, you know, they worked on a certain project with my yarn when they were going through a really hard time. Um, and you know, it was something that kept them going and they've shared those kind of stories with me or I don't know, I can't think of any specific examples and I don't want to share somebody else's story anyway, but like I've heard from people in that way and just knowing that something that I do as my business can touch somebody else's life completely apart from the actual fiber arts part of it. 
that is really humbling to me and I try to keep that in the back of my mind when I start to feel frustrated over something or things aren't going right or I've messed something up or it's like, oh, I can't believe I have to hurry up and get this done. Like, I try to remember, like, I have no idea how what I'm doing right now is going to affect somebody else. You know, this could be something that is really meaningful to somebody else. So I try to always keep that mindset in the back of my mind. And maybe it's not. Maybe it's just another skinny yarn that somebody buys and throws into their stash and doesn't look at again for five years. That happens too. The thing is, like, you just never know how what you're doing in your business, how that might affect somebody else's life in a positive way. And you may never know. You may never know what kind of an effect it's had. But just knowing that maybe it has been something positive, that is something that keeps me going and brings me joy um, and it motivates me to always try to do my best. Um, I never want to send something out that I would not want to receive um, and I think that's just that's that's important to me. That is my video response to Paige's videos on business, and this is sort of long, but clearly I had a lot to say, and it's not alive, so I feel like I'm okay with going a little bit long, because you can always just fast forward, but if you did make it this far, thank you so much, and again, check out Paige's videos. I'll leave her links in the description box below, and... Please come back for the next 90% knitting episode. I will have one out again probably in like a few days. And until then, take care. And if you have any questions about anything that I've said or any comments, feel free to leave them in the comments. I would love to hear what you have to say. I would love to answer any questions you have if I can. And again, if you're someone in business and would like to make a video reply to this video or Paige's videos, please do. I would love to hear from it. I think the more we share, the better off we all are as a community of makers and a community of small business people. We need each other. All right. Till next time, guys. Have fun. Love you. Bye.